It was only during the reign of the Amorite king Hammurabi in the beginning of the second millennium BCE that the city of Babylon became a holy city where any legitimate ruler of southern Mesopotamia had to be crowned, causing the region to then begin to be known as Babylonia. However, after Hammurabi's death, we have over a thousand years of revolts, invasions, dynastic periods, wars, destruction, and backstabbing that only ended in August of 520 BCE when the Persian king Darius the Great ushered the end of Babylon's holy city status and therefore Babylonia has the name of southern Mesopotamia. I mean, how the horrible stuff kept happening, it's just that Babylonia was no more. When Hammurabi's people began to occupy southern Mesopotamia centuries before his time, they brought with them their patron god, Lu Amuru, who was sometimes described as a shepherd god or a storm and weather deity, son of the sky god Anu, who later became the patron god of the Mesopotamian city of Ninab, alongside with his wife, who is usually the mother goddess Ashratum. Besides the Amorites, Throughout millennia, several other peoples, such as the Hittites, Kassites, Elamites, Arameans, Sutians, and Chaldeans, also brought their own contribution to the ever-changing religion of Babylonia, adding to it more gods, rituals, interpretations, and so on. In this video, I am focusing more on the beliefs surrounding the actual city of Babylon rather than the whole region. But since Babylonian religion is a Mesopotamian religion, it follows the general outline created by the ancient Sumerians with, of course, the later Semitic changes, with the main one being, in the case of Babylon, the elevation of the storm god Marduk by King Hammurabi, not only to the patronage of Babylon, but also to the supreme position over all the other gods of the current pantheon. To make such a drastic change acceptable to Mesopotamians outside of Babylon, Hammurabi claimed that Anu and Enlil, the old supreme gods, raised Marduk above the other great gods and gave him Enlil's functions. In reality, what was really done was change the name of Enlil to Marduk or maybe just to their common title of Bel, meaning Lord, whenever translating the Sumerian myths into the Akkadian language. Yes, the Babylonians spoke an Akkadian dialect called Babylonian. A myth that cements Marduk as the supreme god is called Enuma Elish, meaning when on high, which was named after its opening words, but is commonly known as the epic of creation. This myth tells that in the beginning there was only the waters of the primordial gods Apsu and Tiamat until they began to birth other gods, then birthed other gods, and so on. You know how it goes. Very soon, the younger gods started to raise a ruckus, so Apsu decided, against the will of Tiamat, to kill them all, as you do. However, the gods found out about his plan, and Ea, the god of wisdom, concocted a plan that ended up with Apsu and his emissary, Mumu, being murdered, and Apsu's body used as building materials to create Ea's temple, was in that temple that the great Marduk was born. While exalting his grandson, Anu created whirlwinds which disturbed most of the other gods, who in turn went to Tiamat to ask her to stop him and his descendants, guilt tripping her for not doing anything when Apsu was murdered. Convinced by them and furious, she started to create an army of gods and monsters to battle the noisy gods, the main one being Kingo, a son that became her consort, to whom she gave the Tablet of Destinies and exalted over Anu and his descendants. When Anu's father, Anshar, learned that Tiamat was preparing for war, he told Ea to defeat her as he had done to Apsu, but not only he, but every single god present said that they were not powerful enough to do so. Anshar then stood up and suggested Marduk and asked him to be brought in. Marduk, after receiving counsel from his father, agreed to fight with the condition that he would be made supreme above all the other gods. So Anshar sent his emissary 
Gaga to relay the conditions to his parents since only they could grant such an honor. His parents were Lachmu and Lachama, who without understanding the actions of Tiamat and the gods that allied themselves with her, agreed to Marduk's conditions, dubbing him the king of the gods and bestowing blessings upon him. After his coronation, he and the other gods marched towards Tiamat, where furious battle cries in the midst of windstorms and hurricanes announced the start of a fierce battle. During the battle, Marduk trash-talked Tiamat and challenged her to single combat. Losing her senses in anger, she charged him and a gruesome battle took place. It ended with Marduk coming out victorious, imprisoning and torturing the defeated and taking the Tablet of Destinies from Kingo. After torturing Tiamat a little more, he torn her body apart and used it to create what sounds like a beautiful flat earth. <laughs> he also subdivided Apsu's body to make various temples, constructed stations to the gods, created several celestial bodies, determined the year by designating the zones, set up three constellations for each of the twelve months, defined the days and nights, founded the station of Nibiru and caused the moon to shine. After all of that, upon hearing the words of the gods, Marduk decided to create a savage, or Lulu, a man, to be in charge of the works of the gods so they could be at ease. But to do that, he needed lots of blood that had to come from the gods. Upon learning of what his son was going to do, Ea advised him to only sacrifice one god to create humankind. And so, Marduk summoned an assembly and asked the Ijiji gods who they would sacrifice, and they chose Kengo, for, according to them, he was the one that made Tiamat rebel. Kingu was brought before Ea, his blood vessels were severed, and out of his blood they fashioned humankind. Marduk also divided the Anunnaki above and below, stationing 300 in the heavens as a guard and 300 on earth. After he ordered all the instructions, he allotted their portions, and the gods asked how they could pay homage to him. Marduk then told them to build Babylon and the temple with Sagila. After that, the fifty great gods were named and the roles assigned. The Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh can be a video on its own, wink wink, but in short, it narrates the story of a king and hero named Gilgamesh, who befriended a wild man named Enkidu and went on a few adventures, killing the terrible monster Huawa just for kicks and the Bull of Heaven when Ishtar, the goddess of love, brought him to earth to kill Gilgamesh because he refused to marry her since she was unloyal to her previous partners who always ended up suffering after being punished by her, to mention the main ones. The impressive triumph of both heroes caused the anger of the supreme god Enlil, who decided, against the will of the sun god Shamash, that one of them had to die, the one of course being Enkidu. Enkidu's long and painful death at the hands of some terrible illness sparked an intense fear of dying in Gilgamesh's heart, which made him start his search for eternal life. The search for immortality took Gilgamesh to the legendary Utnapishtim, a man who could never die, who, obliging Gilgamesh's inquiry, told him how he acquired such a quality. According to him, a long time ago, the gods tried to diminish humankind's number because they were too noisy. How the turntables. But after they brought down plagues and various other calamities, such as droughts, it didn't seem to be working. So Enlil decided to kill every single human on earth by the way of a massive flood. A great flood, you could say. Not all the gods agreed with him, and so several of them got together and warned the men of a city called Shurupag to tear down their houses and build a ship with their materials to save themselves, but none listened. So, Ea showed the dream to one man named Utnapishtim, 
possibly a humble king who hired several workers to build a giant cube-like ship where he loaded his family, his kinfolk, the craftsmen that worked on its construction, all the silver, gold and living animals he had, and also all the beasts of the field. After the flood, the gods made him and his wife immortal and banished them to live in a faraway land. That is why he is known as Utnapishtim, the faraway. Unable to become immortal via the same method, Gilgamesh came to know from Utnapishtim of a plant that existed under water could make him young again. So Gilgamesh grabbed hold of the plant but lost it to a snake on his way back home to Uruk. The epic ends with Gilgamesh bawling his eyes out. As would I, so close to immortality. Another myth I would like to share narrates how Nergal became the king of the underworld. According to the Babylonians, one day the gods prepared the banquet for Ereshkigal, the ruler of the underworld. But since she couldn't leave the netherworld, she sent her emissary, Namtar, to collect her food portion. Once there, the gods greeted him, but ultimately failed to show him the proper respect, since one of them did not rise before him. Hearing that, Ereshkigal sent Namtar back to capture said god so she could kill him. But after returning, Namtar noticed that the god was not there. For some reason, Namtar got in trouble, but the lines that describe why are missing. Months after the event, Ea told Nergal, who was the god that did not rise before Namtar, to go down to the underworld to present himself before Ereshkigal, but afraid he refused until Ea sent seven other beings with him, probably to make sure he would be safe. For the little hike to the land of the dead, Nergal also brought an army with him, who in front of Ereshkigal's palace opened the gates wide open, allowing him to run into the throne room and capture her. Inside the palace, he took hold of her hair, pulled her off of the throne and prepared to cut her head off. However, Ereshkigal offered to be his wife and give him control of the netherworld and the tablet of wisdom if he spared her life. Hearing that, he took hold of her, kissed her, and wiping her tears off, said, Whatever thou hast wished of me since months past, so be it now.